it is my pleasure to introduce Barbara Rich, who will now lead us in some poetry and mindfulness. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, you're a wonderful worship leader. So, there's a lot of rhetoric about mindfulness, meditation, freedom from distraction, yoga. It almost doesn't matter what you call it. So in the ancient language, Sanskrit, meditation slash mindfulness, it actually translates into this. To meditate, to be mindful, means to reflect, observe, focus, feel, think, and be yourself. So it isn't about sitting on a cushion and going, oh, mm, and trying to stop the thought. We will not stop our thoughts until they put us in the box. It's about noticing what it is that's actually happening when it's happening. So the CEO, the brain, thinks that it needs to put us into the past to replay old scripts, to ruminate about what happened, but it already happened, so we can't do anything about that. Or it thinks that it needs to push us into the future to speculate about what might happen, about which we know nothing. So what we're left with is the present. That's it, that's all we've got is the present time. Even when the present is unpleasant or pleasant or neutral, which is usually what our three choices are. So meditation or mindfulness, it's not a religion, it's not a diet, it's not a set of principles, it's not a new way of life. And the way that it's like poetry is it's about setting an intention to let yourself be in a room the way we are now, simply breathing, or maybe writing something down. When we approach our functioning this way, poetry and mindfulness can sometimes offer answers to the question, how does it feel to exist? So in July, after the world had exploded, I wrote something that I called grammar. Grammar with an R on the end, not like grandma, like grandmother, grammar, English grammar. When normal was an everyday occurrence, we invented who we wanted to be. Now we can create who we really are. When the world was recognizable, we dared to lean toward the preposterous. We had fun making assumptions. We assumed we could believe what was written. Now, we are humbled by not knowing. We're curious or numb or alarmed. Now, we have the bellowing of question marks unrestrained exclamation points, the noisy dangling participles, the ambiguous comma, the confusing quotation marks, and not nearly enough declarative sentences. So what I would invite you to do is to notice what you're sitting on, literally. Soft cushion, hard chair. Notice if you can feel the floor underneath your feet. That connection to the earth grounds us. It might, every now and then, lead to some mindful attention to actually what's functionally sustainably going on in the moment. 
So if you have your feet on the floor, and if you have a back to your chair, if you have your back against the chair, I'll try not to get into the yoga teacher mode. Then we are in the present time, noticing our back is against the chair, our feet are flat on the floor, crown of our head is pressing toward the ceiling, toward the August evening, and we are always suspended between the sky and the earth, regardless, or as they say in New Jersey, irregardless. So a while ago, I wrote something that I called uncomfortable. I write so that I know who I am. I write so that I figure out who I am and what's going on. Once I get some words down on paper or on the keyboard, I get information about myself. So what I would love to share with you is what information comes to you from something that I wrote? Just let that kind of buzz around. This is called uncomfortable. Not knowing is uncomfortable. We want to know. We plan. We expect. We speculate. But we don't really know. Leaving the house, maybe for the last time, she pays the bills waters the plants, pets the cats, and believes her plans for the day. She sends one more text to dearly beloveds, glances fondly at the weedy, wild gardens, makes an assumption about the gains and the losses, looks for the text from her grandson, knowing that she doesn't really know. And it's uncomfortable and just plain human. And it's now. And then it's not now. So I would just ask you to either close your eyes or look down. So in yogic Buddhist terms, when we look down, we quiet the mind. Just looking down eyes open, eyes closed, whatever is going to give you a sense of where you are, who you are, right here and now. And when you notice that inhaling breath is coming in through your nose, you might think of that breath as, well, of course, we breathe. It's no big deal. It's, we have to breathe, however. It's a miracle. That breath and the one following it, it's a miracle. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has access to that. So either looking down with the eyes open or the eyes closed, or just letting your eyes wander around the room that you're in, which is totally familiar. Grounding yourself in the present is one of the definitions of mindfulness. And it's one of the definitions of the words of poems that sometimes can drag you back from the past or away from the future and plunk you right down in the middle of now. So I would invite you to notice the breath that comes in through maybe one side of the nose a little bit more than the other side of the nose. The way the breath comes into the physical body. And maybe picturing that breath getting to the mind, the lungs, the brain, the heart, where it's really needed. So I'm going to ask you to just go into some kind of internal silence, just for a couple of breaths. And see what comes up. Something that might have come up from the poems, or something that's coming up that's surprising, right here and now.
mindful, inner, non judgmental attention. And knowing that it becomes a little uncomfortable, and we get to notice how uncomfortable, how neutral, how comfortable. And I have a bell of mindfulness. And when I hear these vibrations, feel these vibrations, this spell of mindfulness from Tibet, the vibrations bring us into the present. One day, one day while drinking your tea, you'll stop and notice that the knot in your heart is quieter than usual. You'll wonder why that is. And then you'll remember that all the longing, the wishing, the resistance has in fact loosened up. And you'll put down the cup of tea and rest your head in your hands and you'll feel a trickle of something like pleasure. Maybe a shard of surprise. And although it wasn't what you wanted and it wasn't all that you had planned, maybe it was just good enough. He will grow cold. You'll begin to see that that plan you drafted long ago, the storyline you created and retold and believed, that story has changed. Changed enough to let in some satisfaction and some acceptance. And yes, strange but true, a tiny bit of happiness. So one of the things that keeps me aware of what's going on is when I get some words written down and I notice how often the CEO in my head has pushed me into the past or dragged me into the future. One of the things that came up for me was the discomfort I experience every now and then being single, otherwise, not, otherwise known as not partnered. So I wrote about it and I call it single. And since all of you have a partner, you might extrapolate from this in your mindfulness practice to something else not exactly the same as me. Single or married, we must face the face in the mirror. Married or single, the mind wanders 47% of the time. The rhetoric from childhood, which is alive and well in our DNA, hums loudly. Better to be married than to be alone. And yet, single isn't lonely or alone or despondent or less than. It's just a way to be confidently 
self-partnered. Dressing for oneself, befriending oneself. Being self-partnered. I trot down the aisle, smiling, for better or worse, till death do us part. So that was part of my mindfulness practice because the reality is that is what's real for me. I'm wondering in what way it resonates for you. So because this is mindfulness practice, I want to share Something from before. Some of you are way too young to know what I'm going to be talking about. Some of you will get it. So one of my granddaughters educated me some years ago to count my half birthdays. So this week I'm officially 86 and a half. And I'm calling this they used to be phone booths. We used to signal in the car by sticking our hand outside the driver's side window. I used to wear a girdle. They used to collect for the Jimmy Fund in the movie theater before the film began. My dad and I grew vegetables during the Second World War in a victory garden. We use cloth diapers for our four children, my ex-husband and I. My children used to watch Mr. Rogers and cigarette ads. Since then, blizzards have come and gone. Stories were told and forgotten. Grandchildren became adults. Daughters made close friends with each other. We learn something new or we don't. Used to be is what used to be. There used to be phone booths. So when the mindfulness, freedom from distraction, lack of focus, busy, 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 takes over our lives. We need something sustainable, functional, to ground ourselves so that we don't miss moments of our lives. The reason that it's important to me is because at 86 and a half, I don't want to miss moments of my life. Uh-uh. I want every single moment. And when I was thinking about every single moment, a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who is one of the most wonderful Buddhist Vietnamese teachers, he said, it is possible that the next Buddha will not take the form of an individual. The next Buddha may take the form of a community, a community practicing understanding and loving kindness, a community practicing mindful living. This may be the most important thing we can do, the survival of the earth. So every now and then, when we allow ourselves to focus on actually what's going on, even when we don't like it, we are in the present. And it's only in the present that we can make good decisions or lousy decisions. We can't make decisions in the past. We have no idea what our decisions are going to be tomorrow or the next day. Similar to when are the schools going to open, we don't know. So to put some value on mindfulness, freedom from distraction, being in the present time, it takes patience, it takes perseverance, it takes yoga practice. It takes prioritizing it. Otherwise, we're going to miss moments of our lives because 
all we have is the present time. So while I was thinking about the present time, I wrote this and I called it, every day is trash day. Even though the household recycle only gets picked up twice a month, every day can be trash day if I can let go of the clutter. Whatever it is that overfills my brain and results in predictions, assumptions, and old stories, whatever I can lug from the attic of my mind to the curb of acceptance, might make every day a tiny bit more joyful. Am I willing to take the time, clear the space, quiet the inner critic, and hope to get it all out there before the truck comes? Every day could be trash day. But once again, I would just ask you to ground yourself by noticing what you're sitting on. That's being mindful. And if what you're sitting on is uncomfortable, make it more comfortable. Go get another cushion. Move a little bit. Notice that your feet are anchored. They're rooted, facing the earth. Those roots, those anchors happen from our community, from our willingness to be ourselves, from our willingness to share what is not popular, to speak up, to speak our truth, and to trust that speaking our truth is going to help keep us in the present time. Here's the beauty of yet, Y-E-T, yet. He asks, did you sign up for the yoga class? Not yet, he replies. Did you hear from your son, they ask? Not yet, he answers. The beauty of yet opens the way to possibilities. Never, always, and should muddies the path and hardens the jaw. Maybe we haven't forgiven or been forgiven yet. Perhaps we didn't create the priorities yet. Did you send that email, she asks? Not yet, he replies. The power of yet can strengthen a fierce determination to renew a vow. Rather than hiding behind a furrowed brow or believing false data, we can open all the doors and let in what we don't know yet. Notice if you can relax your shoulders. Notice if you can relax the jaw. Notice if you can bring some mindful attention to big muscles, small muscles. The reality of being exactly where you are, who you are right now. The plans will wait. The text that you need to send will wait. The report that needs to get written will wait. The laundry will wait. The grocery list will wait. The cats will wait to get fed. This is now. All of the rest of that is later. Mindfulness, meditation, yoga, freedom from distraction, focus happens in the present time. This is called worth a try. Have you ever held so still, hearing traffic or the wind 
of the whistling of the tea kettle, looking at treetops, looking at the porch swings, smelling cinnamon toast, noticing clouds that look like your father, hearing wild geese calling to each other, their language not understood but fully heard. Have you ever just stopped and waited without thinking about thinking, without agenda, with the five senses wide open? Sneaking past the turmoil and the clutter, a kind of calm emerges, a gentle shock of contentment. The five senses are wide open, the breath is intentional, and the inner judge and jury are out for lunch. Have you ever held so still? So I am going to give us this vibration again from the singing bowl, from the bell of mindfulness. And the next time that you're anxious or angry, judgmental, dealing with something that's very difficult, see if you can just remember back to when you heard this bell of mindfulness, when you felt the vibrations in your skull. Notice if you have any real connection with your breath. Notice if the breath and your body and your five senses are all connected. In this time of unknowable, in which we're all living, we get disconnected. The mind goes in one direction, the body goes in another direction. Smell, taste, seeing, hearing, feeling are out of our awareness. The practice of mindfulness brings us back again and again and again to right here and now. And then it changes. So that unpleasant thought that pain in the low back, that tightness in the muscles changes. What it was an hour ago is different now, no doubt. This one is called Before You Press Send. It's one o'clock in the morning and the mental chatter compels you to compose the email, which will split his heart open or shake her confidence or shock their perceptions. The urgency to get it said and get it written and get it sent is powerful. And once you hit send, the pain is traveling from your fingers to the heart mind and feelings of another. Before you press send, let it rest. Let it rest in your awareness of the possible impact and then pause. Picture him or her or them. Picture them with your heart wide open and then wait and then wait some more and then wait some more before you press send. So we're coming up to probably when Melissa is gonna say, okay, Barb, that's enough. One of the things I want to suggest, 
the power of the pause is not comfortable, especially for Americans. We are driven, which is why this time that we're living is very difficult because we are driven. See if you can incorporate the power of the pause into everyday occurrence. When you're brushing your teeth, pause and notice that you're brushing your teeth. Stand on your tiptoes. Activates a different part of the brain when we do something that's not habitual. Pause. There's plenty of time. Actually, there's plenty of time. This one I call says who. We don't want to be told the obvious. You're overbooked. You need to let go. You should take yoga. We want to know we are loved. We need to know we are truly loved and truly valued. Spare us the ubiquitous advice about slowing down. Spare us the conventional wisdom about living in the age of distraction. We need to feel heard. We need to be seen. We want the healing of touch. We crave authentic attention. We want conversation without words. We rejoice at being heard and seen. You and I, all of us, we want laughter and picnics and toes that wiggle with delight. So while your toes are wiggling with delight, and maybe you're relaxing your jaw, and maybe you're quieting that inner critic, I want to read you something that I put on our, whatever that is, a post suddenly at home. And I'm calling it, and the winner is, I am not interested in how much you earn, working from home or not working at all. I want to know if you acknowledge the hands waving from passing cars. While you walk alone on quiet roads, noticing the hands waving from passing cars. I don't care if you completed the task you thought important or how often you get takeout or whether or not you made a donation. I want to know if you smiled instead of frowned at the old man not wearing a mask. It doesn't interest me if you pray. It doesn't interest me if you only shop at Whole Foods or if you wear the same clothes every day or how many times you've broken your vows. Did you nurture yourself today? Did you nurture someone else? You have my full attention when you tell me that you accept not knowing when you let go of predictions, when you take the time to take your time. So when what's coming has come, and we've had dinner together sitting at one round table, when we have forgiven the relatives, and when we've noticed our new habits, what will matter then? What really matters? And the winner is real, messy, non judgmental, heartbreaking, unconditional love. Thank you. As we go our way in peace, you'll take with you anything that was true, which was maybe useful which was kind. Other than that, you can let the rest go. Thank you.